Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Joanne Quinn and Michael Fullen on what's deep about deep learning. Just to let you know, if you have any questions for the presenters, please send them to us using the chat function in Zoom. Please send them when you think of them, and we'll answer as many questions as possible at the end of the meeting. But please send them using the chat function, and we'll get to as many as we can towards the end of the meeting. If we go to the next slide, upcoming webinars, Deidre LaFevre and Kay Twyford on adaptive expertise and professional learning. Calderon, Dove, Stair Fenner, Gottlieb, Honigsfeld, Ward Singer, Slack, and Zakarian on breaking down the wall, essential shifts for English learner success. And November 18th, John San Giovanni on Jumpstart Student Reasoning and Number Sense in Elementary Grades and Beyond. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Sharon Pentergast, Senior Marketing Manager for Corwin, to introduce today's presenters. Hello, and thank you for joining us today. It is my great pleasure to introduce Joanne Quinn and Michael Fullen, who will be presenting What's Deep About Deep Learning. Joanne Quinn is an international consultant and author on system change, leadership, and learning. As co-founder and global director of New Pedagogies for Deep Learning, she leads the capacity building of a global innovation partnership across eight countries focused on transforming learning. Joanne has provided leadership at all levels of education as a superintendent of education, implementation advisor to the Ontario Ministry of Education and director of continuing education at the University of Toronto. Joanne's diverse leadership roles and her passion to open windows of opportunity for all give her a unique perspective on influencing positive change. Michael Fullen, has had a long and distinguished career as a researcher and developer, senior administrator and policy advisor to senior politicians. He served as Dean of Education for the University of Toronto from 1988 to 2003, leading the development of a world-renowned faculty of education. Professor Fullen is currently engaged in developmental work in over 10 countries in the global North and South. He has written several award-winning books that have been translated into many languages. And he is also co-director of, of the New Pedagogies for Deep Learning Global Initiative. Joanne and Michael's newest book, along with co-authors co Joanne McEachan, Mag Gardner, and Max Drummy, is Dive into Deep Learning, Tools for Engagement. This book has rocketed to bestseller status just weeks after publishing in late summer. Welcome, Joanne and Michael. Please feel free to start your presentation. Thanks so much, Sharon, for your kind words. And we're really thrilled, both of us, to be with you today and have a chance to talk about our pet passion, which is about deep learning and how we help all children achieve their potential. And as Sharon said, um, our newest book is out and it captures the work we've been doing with practitioners in the field. And so we're anxious to share that with you. Um, our title was intended to be a bit provocative, what's deep about deep learning. We're starting to see this uh, term of deep learning or deeper learning across the globe. And we want to be sure that when we use that, we all have a general understanding. So we're gonna unpack it a bit today, start to build some collective understanding of what we really mean by deep learning, but more importantly, how do we make that happen and make it happen for all kids? So we're gonna talk about three things during our time together. Um, as Jeff has said, um, we encourage you to uh, put some questions together and put those in the chat box. We're gonna speak for about 45 minutes and then we're going to spend the rest of the time responding to the ideas that uh, you have put forward. So we're gonna start first of all with, you know, why deep learning and what is deep learning? Then we're going to spend some time on how it works, some tips and tools and ways that people are getting their heads around the idea and also implementing it on larger scale within classroom schools and whole districts. 
And then we're going to talk about some of our emerging discoveries, the things we're finding as we do more and more of this work with practitioners. So to start us off, I'm going to uh, uh, turn this over to Michael, who's going to talk about, you know, why deep learning is so important and why now. Okay, uh, thanks, Joanne. And I'm just noticing from the chat that We've got people from Australia and uh, many other places around the globe, and that's the way it should be for this topic. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about these three things very briefly, but I want to step back in a context. In 2015, uh, Joanne and I were merrily going along with our uh, new publication on Coherence, a Corwin publication. So we put this together. We thought Coherence was the answer, and it is to a certain extent, uh, with the four quadrants of focus, collaborative cultures, uh, deep learning and um, securing accountability. So that seemed like good and stable, but it became quickly apparent to everybody, and increasingly so, that all was not well. It wasn't just a matter of making an existing system coherent. It was the system was fundamentally um, not up to the task. So you, I could give you chapter and verse on this, but basically if we take disengagement it's quite clear, data are coming out our ears on this, that uh, the majority of students who um, haven't done well in the past and still don't do well in the current, in fact, less so, uh, that it's something like two thirds of students by the time they get to grade 10 are not, um, are not connected to schooling. They're finding it increasingly boring or irrelevant. So that's one piece of it, but the new part that's coming in is that even students who did traditionally well are not finding it engaging. So we have the alienated people in the first place, those that thought they were doing well, uh, finding that it's wanting. So I'll give you one, uh, one piece of data. Heather Mellon is the uh, director, the research director of the Youth Center at Stanford. And she's been studying how youth are relating to life for the last uh, four or five years and wrote a book about a, about a few months ago, it was published. And she found even among the senior uh, high school students, grades 11 and 12, that were headed for post-secondary education, only 24% of them had any sense of purpose about where they were going. I mean, they could say, yeah, I wanna go to a good university, I wanna get good grades and that, but it was all pretty much a means to no end that they didn't have an end. So uh, we have this massive disengagement which is uh, covering almost everybody now, uh, the students, even those students who did well. So stick that as a big, big problem, an increasing problem. The second, inequity, um, it's been stalled for, at least stalled for since 1990, because uh, after the, from 1960 to 1985 or so, uh, the equity, uh, inequity got reduced. Uh, but uh, recently, and it's compounded because there's huge gaps now, and you know this, I think, uh, in, um, in, in poverty between those who do well and those that don't well. Now, I'm not talking about education, but more, uh, more life everywhere. So around the world, massive and galloping inequity. And it shows up and affects schooling. And there's a whole number of things here where we get little snippets of increases, like the positive outliers, the districts and schools in Ontario that the learning policy Institute has been studying. Yeah, they're little, they're, they're pockets of it, but we feel that fundamentally it's not going, it's not able to do that because the blockages are so massive. And then well being, which is coming, you know, the social emotional learning and other aspects of well being coming into the agenda, but it's just a latecomer and it's kind of patched in from our point of view. And the thing about well being, the way we want to put it for deep learning is, uh, is it's about, our, our goal is about what is good for uh, learning on the one hand and what is good for life on the other hand. And again, I would say that a lot of students might go through the grades, get passing grades and go on to university and still not be good at life. So we're trying to struggle with well-being as good at learning and good at life. I want to leave those hanging a bit because this is the uh, fundamental investigation we're involved in. And, and finally, I would say the good news about this is uh, with all of our work for the last uh, 15 years is we partner with leading practitioners in the field around the world in at least eight countries, but really more. And uh, these leading practitioners, uh, our partners are not individuals only, they are also groups at 
the school level, at the district and at regional level and at the state level. And in that kind of partnership, we're starting to spell out what, is, uh, what are some of the possibilities. We always say, because we experience it all the time, that the best ideas we get are from leading practitioners. So we're in an ex a developmental mode now against a lot of odds, which are the societal, I'm gonna say, society is getting worse uh, on almost all indicators and the trend is worsening. So this is where our deep learning comes into play. Can it reverse, can it arrest that trend and can it reverse it? And that's, that's what we're talking about as we move from coherence to deep learning, engage the world, change the world is the theme we got from students and teachers. It's the theme we see and it's the, it's the, it's the light at the end of the tunnel, hopefully, but tons of work have to be done. So Joanne's gonna launch us into some of that. So one of the things that we realized back in 2014 when we began this deep learning work is that our students were facing a very different world and those three issues that Michael has just illustrated, you know, have come even more to the fore over the last five years. But we realized that just doing the same thing we've been doing for years wasn't going to get us to a new outcome and so that it really was time to reimagine the process of learning. And so that's what we set about doing. Um, we wanted to give you just a, a little glimpse of um, one set of schools in Troy, Michigan, where this kind of deep learning has started to really take root and just give you a, a flavor for the kind of difference it makes in kids' lives um, as you watch. So let's just tune in. We feel glorious, glorious. We can We started with a question and the question was, how can we help those who have little to no access to healthy foods? The marketing and fundraising team went together and they figured out the name Project Root. R stands for reaching others. The first O stands for opportunities. Second O stands for organic foods. The fourth letter T stands for together. So we decided to go as a partnership for our first grade and fifth grade buddies. I learned so many things through math, science, social studies, writing, reading, all the subjects. So many people are hungry and actually 48.8 million people are in hunger. We really just thought, well, if we make a school garden, then we could donate those foods. But then we thought, we obviously can't take care of a garden when like Mother Nature is giving snow. So we thought making a greenhouse is the best option to help the world. The food, well, once they're ready and ripe, we'll give it to charities, such as Food Drives, Forgotten Harvest, UNICEF. We still have the question of how do we raise money? We need experts to help us. So that's why we call them Master Gardeners. So we thought if we kind of lock arms together with other businesses that are garden businesses, then that would kind of help us make the best greenhouse for all the kids to learn. We feel glorious, glorious. We can make a difference. We can make a difference. No matter how young or how old you are, you can still make an impact to the world. One of the things we found is that we're never too young and we're never too old for deep learning. So hopefully that helps you think about some of the possibilities of thinking about the learning process differently and also thinking about what can happen in our schools. So as we set out um, five years ago to figure out how to do this better, we knew that we had lots of knowledge, but we needed to pull, um, as Michael said, we believe in working with practitioners. And so we said, how could we do this better? If we wanted our children to learn deeply in that way that builds those competencies that we're going to talk about, how do we go about doing that? And we set as our goal or our purpose to foster what we termed deep learning so that all children could contribute to the common good, address global challenges and flourish in a complex world. And while that's a mouthful, the two words that most important to us were all learners, that we weren't interested in something that would just be, you know, for some gifted and talented classes or some um, 
boutique type of learning environments, but something that could scale up to serve all. And secondly, that we were focused on how to help students flourish, how to develop the talents of those students that we're thinking that have never been engaged in schools, or even those who are engaged, um, but are not thinking about their whole person, but thinking more narrowly. So that was what focused us. And then we said, what will we do? And we said, we invited countries to join us with the purpose of building knowledge and practices that foster deep learning and whole system change so that it's happening for all students, all schools, all districts, all countries, and to share that knowledge in a way that will really make a difference for everyone. And you can see here the eight countries. And they're very disparate on many continents, as you can see, Canada, the US, Uruguay and South America, Finland, the Netherlands, Australia, New Zealand, and Hong Kong, our, our newest country. And you may ask, why did we spread it out so much? And one of the reasons was we wanted to have a proof of concept, an idea that if this works in different contexts, there is something there that really could help all children to thrive and to be as successful as possible. And to date, we're impacting well over a million students in the eight countries, uh, more than 2,000 schools currently engaged with us and probably 40,000 or more teachers um, directly working on some of these ideas. So let's take a look at how this really works. Because our goal, as you see from the quote here, is that we wanted to move deep learning from something that some teachers are doing, and, and that we have wonderful examples, but doing on their own perhaps, doing because they have the passion, the expertise, to making that a foundation of learning for all, to make it more accessible. And that's really what this book is about, is how do we take some of these ideas and make them accessible to everyone to build their own capacity and the capacity of their peers and their schools to improve. So the first step we found is that we're seeing lots of good examples of problem-based learning, project-based learning, experiential learning, inquiry, and so on. But that often those are ends in themselves and they're focused on the teaching aspect. What we wanted to do was focus on the learning aspect. And so we began by describing what we wanted our students to know, be able to do, and be like. And you see here the six global competencies that we distilled for deep learning. Four of them have been around for a very long time, probably since 99, 97, when we started talking about 21st century skills. But the problem is they haven't been enacted very well or very intentionally. And we haven't had really good ways to measure them that would travel across classrooms and schools and districts and beyond. So those are um, collaboration, communication, creativity, critical thinking. We've done lip service, but not as much in-depth work. Uh, two that we added to the list were character and citizenship. Character being those inward facing um, attitudes, aptitudes of, of grit and tenacity and perseverance, um, empathy, compassion, uh, being able to take a positive stance towards their own learning and then the outward facing qualities in citizenship of having that global perspective, um, being able to show interest in the environment, in other people, uh, to have that compassion and empathy for the bigger world around them. These have formed an anchor. They have allowed us to build a common language across schools, but also across countries. And that we have found is a really important piece of moving forward is giving teachers and students and parents a, a way to converse with one another about what we're aiming for. And we define deep learning really as the process of acquiring these six global competencies. But we also, um, and you can see here that we define them just with some strands underneath. Those are dimensions of each of those big ideas. But as good as that was, it still wasn't enough for us to be precise enough to be intentional in practice. So the next thing we realized is that if we are going to focus on new outcomes, these global competencies, which are really an overlay to the curriculum, we're still learning about something, 
but we are looking at it through the lens of one of these competencies or several of them. But for example, if I'm teaching history, I, and I am intentional in thinking about critical thinking, I could teach that history program at a very low critical thinking level where we're basically covering the text, the names, the dates, the places, the events, or we can bump that up to a much higher level of rigor with critical thinking where we're not only looking at just what has happened, but the implications, what led up to it, what's happened since then, how it's affecting us today, looking at relationships between countries, and you can imagine the way we can really build a much more robust. And the difference is that we're saying these six C's help us to be more intentional in thinking about our design of our learning. So we decided that we needed um, one more layer to make the deep, uh, the six global competencies more precise. And we created what we call a deep learning progression, which is really a description of what that student's knowledge and skills might look like at different levels as they develop the competency. And you can see on your screen just a snapshot of a portion of one of these progressions. It is different than a rubric in that it is intended to measure multiple aspects of student work over a period of time. So products, performances, observations, tests, all of those things combined. In the left-hand column, we identified the dimensions of that particular skill. This one is about collaboration. So those are two of the aspects of collaboration we might be focusing on. And across the top, you can see that we have five levels of growth. Inside each of those cells are descriptors that tell us um, how a student may be performing at that certain level of proficiency. They are purposely not a checklist because the purpose of them is to foster conversation. So professional dialogue by teachers as they look at their students and say, when I observe all of their learning, here's what I see. Here's where I might think that they are working right now. And also to recognize that there is an arrow at the end of that bar at the top because we're talking about never ending. So it, it's a continuous development and an ongoing process. We find that these have been extremely useful as a starting point to assess where our children are on some of these dimensions and the different competencies. Teachers then can use them if, for example, they find that their student or their groups of students are particularly emerging, they can look forward to the developing cell to get an idea of how to develop that in their students in the next chunk of learning. They use them to monitor and adjust how well the students are learning and certainly at the end of a unit or a, a chunk or a period of time to really look at has the student made progress. So it's a much more intentional way of designing learning, but also assessing the growth over time. Uh, teachers find them very useful and we have also created some student friendly versions, which um, students can use to assess themselves to say, here's where I am now and here's what I need to do to get better at any of these particular areas. So that was a start, that was an anchor, and that helped us know where we were going in terms of what did we mean by deep learning and what might it look like as we started to foster it in class. But the next big challenge is how do we create deep learning for all kids all the time? Teachers are very, very busy. Principals are very, very busy. How do we help people shift their practice in a way that is doable. And so what we did was we identified what we call four elements of learning design. And that these, thinking about these in a very simplistic way helps us to plan and design. And I'll just describe each of these four aspects of learning design for you. And then we're going to take a look at another example so you can see what they might look like in, progress, in process. The first one of these is pedagogical practices. Of course, we need to determine what is the, once we have our, our learning goals and our success criteria or our standards or objectives, what's the best way for our students to learn and make intentional choices of those practices. It may be problem-based, project-based, it may be inquiry, it may be direct teaching, but thinking about what's the best way for them to learn. 
The second big chunk is learning partnerships. What you will see in the project group that we just um, viewed, students working with other students, collaborating with experts and people in the community, uh, teachers and students having new and different relationships, those things don't happen by chance. So we invite teachers to be thinking about how do we create the partnerships? Which ones might we need during this chunk of learning? And how do we make sure that we've scaffolded the learning so our students are ready? The third aspect is learning environment, and it has two parts. The first part has to do with creating a culture of learning. When we want students to do what you just saw those young people doing, take risks, be innovative, be creative, feel that anything is possible, you have to create a culture where they have a sense of well-being, where they are connected, where they belong, where they um, can trust in you and one another. So that culture of learning is really important, important for the teachers and for the students. The other half of learning environments is being aware of the virtual and the physical environment. So you can see that as we start to move outside of the walls of the classroom, we need to be intentional in thinking about how will we do that? When will we do that? And last but not least, we want people to be thinking about leveraging digital. And this is not last because it's less important, but because we want it not to be an add-on, but to be a question we ask ourselves when we think about the learning that we have in mind, how might we use the tools and aspects of the digital world to really amplify that learning, to deepen the learning, to take it to another level? So that if we're doing science, we're thinking as scientists and using the digital world um, and so on, instead of just thinking about substitution ways. So instead of writing a report, we're going to do a PowerPoint. That's a slightly better use of the digital world, but not really taking it, we think, to the levels that it possibly could. So those are the four elements of learning design. And you'll see here um, a placemat organizer that we've created. And it, it's very simple. You could put it on your screen, sit down with a, a colleague or a grade level team or a department team, and very quickly, um, in 10 minutes, come up with the um, basics of a unit of learning or a chunk of learning. Because you simply, first of all, decide, given our learning goals and our success criteria, you know, which of these six competencies might be most important for us to focus on in the next week or two weeks, whatever the length of time is. And then to brainstorm, well, what are the pedagogies that would be most useful for us, considering where our students are and where they need to go? What are the kind of learning partnerships that we might have? Are our children ready for them? What do we need to do? What kind of learning environment? Are kids willing to take a risk? Are we going to need to prepare them for that? And are we staying inside the classroom or are we venturing forth? And finally, how can we best make use of the digital world? So if you happen to have any old school things at your fingertips where you can make some jot notes or be thinking, think about how these four elements might be playing out. What decisions do you think the teachers might have made prior to what you're going to see in the next video? In this one, you're going, we're going to go to Australia. So hello to all of our Australian friends, just came back from there a week ago. And we're going to visit with three schools in Victoria that have been working on deep learning and they've decided to get together and help their students think about how to solve the problems that are facing us in the future. Uh, these are elementary schools. The students would be about uh, 10, 11 years of age. So the teachers and the students have collaborated for a, a period of time doing research, doing a lot of preparation. What you're going to see in the video is the culminating activity. So you're going to have to make inferences about the kinds of pedagogical practices, the partnerships, the environment, and the leveraging digital. But we think that you will enjoy this. It's called Young Minds of the Future. At Canterbury Primary School today, we're hosting Young Minds of the Future Expo, where three schools have come together, Chatham Primary, Ringwood North Primary and Canterbury, to do a project all about the future. We each have to research a problem 
and then create something to solve it. Seeing all these amazing inventions everywhere is awesome. The community's really been great. We've had over 50 people come to our store so far. I've seen so many cool things from little juice cups to feeding the homeless to transportation, things like our idea. We've even seen around the world subways. So this is the automatic dog feeder. You'd set the timer as for three o'clock, as you can see with the wires in there. And then as the day would go past, it hit that, which is in the current through, and then the dog food would fall down. I thought of it because both my parents go to work and we go to school, and my dog's always left outside at home and she usually just sleeps, so at night she's up. I think it would be really great for the owners and also their pets' lives and their relationships between each other. Our idea is a sober sensor, which basically is a steering wheel that will scan for drugs and alcohol through the sweat. As to why we want this is to uh, contribute to the Towards Zero Fund, which is an initiative that will hopefully stop drink driving on the roads and make sure that less people die on our roads. I decided to make the life pot because I love plants and water and all the beautiful things in nature, and I don't want it to disappear. This will help people look after their plants better and also save water. It shows when your plants is, is not watered because there's no energy in the dirt. So the light won't go on. But when it's wet, the light will go on. To so show this plant is watered, you don't need to water it anymore. We decided to make cricket flower cookies because the population growth on Earth is really fast. Livestock is just not that sustainable. Cows are one of the largest producers of methane on Earth and methane can contribute to greenhouse gases. However, insects don't let out any methane, so they can reduce greenhouse gases. So when we found out that in the United States alone, there were 4,000 drownings between 2005 and 2014, we thought we had to do something. So we invented a drone that flies over your head and drops a life buoy to save you. So while the lifeguards come and swim out to you, um, you're floating there ready for them. Just walking through this small exhibition, looking at all the new inventions, it really just makes you think, oh, that's a good idea and that could help me every day. And like some of them are really cool and I could get and find them really helpful. Events like Young Minds of the Future is important because it's a chance to work with other people from other schools and hear other people's ideas. We believe that most of these ideas will make it into the real world. If not, they will be considered and people will know about them. It shows kids creativity and it lets people have their own point of view. In Young Minds of the Future, we didn't really have a standard. We didn't have to make a certain thing. We got to do basically anything that we thought would change the world and I find that really interesting. So thank you so much. Uh, I hope that you're busy chatting to one another about the ideas that are fostered as you take a look at some of these amazing students. And you can see there are two very different contexts, but still students who are energized, who are getting a voice, um, who are taking the lead in their own learning. And we don't want you to walk away thinking deep learning is only about saving the world and these large projects. If we had more time, we could show you a whole range of examples that have been sent to us by the practitioners. I think that the reason that they, we see so many of these coming forward is teachers say, you know, this is the kind of learning I've always wanted to do, but I felt so constrained by textbooks and by testing. And now that I have opened things up to my students, I can see what's possible. So we do find that the learning experiences that foster deep learning certainly involve the higher order cognitive processes. There's more rigor in them. Um, they often Im immerse students in issues or big ideas, the big concepts. What's important is that they integrate the academic and these personal capabilities, the competencies at the same time. It's not an either or. You know, we don't do deep learning on Wednesday afternoon. It's a way of thinking about the process of learning. We're finding that they're much more active, authentic, challenged, challenging, and student-centered. And they do sometimes impact the world, but they also just impact the students themselves and their everyday learning as well. We call it daily deep learning. 
So they can take place in a range of settings. It can be a half hour class where they delve deeply by focusing on a competency, or it can be a six week unit, um, such as you've seen uh, just in that last example. One of the things that we do see is that students come alive. This new role for students involves them as co-designers and co-learners. And the way we find teachers get started at this is probably just by giving students a choice of A or B to start with. But as it grows from there, they start to see the excitement of the students as they get engaged with more authentic tasks. And if they've created that environment for learning, the students just flourish, they thrive, and that propels teachers to try more. It does mean a new role for teachers. Um, we can talk about these three kinds of roles um, in professional learning, in communities of practice, theoretically, but what we're seeing is that teachers take on these roles of an activator, of really establishing the learning goals, but then being able to make choices and uh, monitor that learning with just-in-time delivery, asking the right questions to spur that next level of thinking and doing by the students. By being a culture builder that creates that culture of learning and makes sure that all students can thrive and because they can demonstrate their talents in a variety of ways. And finally, to be collaborators with students and with families and community, but also with one another. So those are some of the things that have helped us bring this to life. And I'll turn it to Michael now to talk about some of the things that we're learning. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Joanne. I just want to step back for a second here and say a couple of things. One is, if you go to Google and uh, type in deep learning, you get a whole slew of things on artificial intelligence. And so uh, it's important, it's dominated by that. And I think the best way, the quickest way of saying this is that artificial intelligence is the machine version of deep learning. And our, our uh, approach is the uh, human version of deep learning. And so we have, we could talk about technology in a lot of ways, but I'm going to say flat out that technology does not do humans any favors when you add it all up. We've got to be more proactive in, in our case, leveraging digital. So that's one way of putting it. The second thing, and this is going a bit out in the limb, but it's, uh, it's true as a tendency, that when you think of uh, deep learning that's coming out in education now, that focuses on better standards, better assessment, uh, drawing on learning sciences for the pedagogy. All of that we favor, we're part of it, we, we help develop it, but there's one problem, and I'm gonna slightly overstate it, state it by saying it predominantly focuses on critical thinking. One of the six C's, it predominantly focuses on the cognitive side. Now, some of it is connected now to SEL and a lot of other things like that, but uh, uh, we want you to think that if you're not doing some of the C's that engage the whole learner, not just in the learning part, but in the application to life, there's a problem. So it's a, it's a reflective question I have more than a, a, you know, a big conclusion. So once we go though into the six C's, more, more than critical learning in other words, uh, we find that uh, again, that some of the, a lot of the people are making uh, gains on good collaboration among students working together. Uh, they're making uh, good gains on the critical thinking itself, uh, on communication skills. All of that is in track down the way, uh, but they're not so strongly integrative around creativity. Ken Robinson has said that for years. Uh, creativity, which is always on the list, has never come alive much on any scale. And our deep learning version, I hope you saw from the two uh, videos, is a natural for creativity to start flourishing. So uh, that's one we call as a, a catalytic C in the sense that the C's are, some of the C's cause other things to happen. So, uh, so creativity. A character and citizenship, and these are, it's important that you don't misinterpret these words, these concepts. Uh, they're, uh, they can be seen in some countries, for example, they say, we don't want character education because it's moralizing. Well, that's not the definition, but we can see from certain cultures why it might be interpreted that way. Uh, other countries on uh, citizen, think about citizenship while well, you're trying to get citizens to toe the line. Again, that's not what it's meant, but so make sure we understand the concepts. But above all, once you understand them as 
catalyst, as dynamic. And all six are important. Uh, we, our schools that work with us don't deal with all six on Monday uh, or, or all six at a time. Sometimes they start with a couple and they uh, branch out and integrate from there. So it's much more dynamic and learner oriented and you have to uh, decide on your position on that. So the important thing is that these things be uh, seen as uh, these three especially. And that leads me then to the other concepts we're trying to um, nail. And uh, this is that engaging the students in something meaningful for themselves and for the world at large. So uh, engagement is not just occupied in a, in a, you know, a deep way. Uh, you can be engaged doing video games for like 18 hours or more a day. Uh, this is engagement in something that is meaningful for the student. And usually we're finding these days that uh, the millennials or whoever uh, we, we want to talk of the, about the group is that students want to do something that has at least two things to it that are really big for us. One is meaningful for themselves in their local community, their own uh, ideas. But more and more, they want to do something that's meaningful for the world. So uh, the, we don't have to think of students saving the world tomorrow, but the trajectory here, the immediate immersion for sure, is that students feel if I'm part of something that's meaningful for me locally, and it has some connection to where the world is going, knowing that the world is not going in a good direction. Almost every, every student knows that now, every child knows that. Uh, they've got a really learning nexus here that's incredibly powerful because it pulls them in and it develops their skills to do great analysis, to learn a lot, and really literally before your eyes to become better citizens. Uh, there's almost, we haven't found a student young enough who's not a change agent. Uh, that, uh, and uh, this, when it flourishes, it flourishes. So I'm uh, pessimistic on the one side about what's happening in the world because it's declining, the galloping inequity, for example, and uh, climate, a whole bunch of things. But I'm also optimistic because kids are paying more attention to it and adults working with them are mobilizing this and this can be very powerful. Uh, secondly, then, um, in this domain, one of our team members is Gene Clinton, Dr. Gene Clinton, who's a neuroscientist uh, focusing on young children. And we, you see her, uh, she's now well embedded in our team, but before she got embedded, she said, I want to get involved more because what I'm seeing in the six C's, and I won't read out this whole quote, but it's so powerful, is that you can take students who are not doing so well and connect them to the six C's and it immunizes them from further difficulty because their lives are uh, adversely affecting them and what they're able to do. So we see that part, but we also see the part of uh, well-being more, being more powerful. And this is where we get to equity. And uh, there's, a, there's, there's a growing hypothesis that we see that equity and excellence are intertwined, that they're not separate, that in six C's, that students who go into the six C's, that they, uh, that they get attracted to deeper work, deeper analytical work, deeper meaningful, and that we've seen in this kind of um, hypothesis that students who are traditionally alienated from learning even, are the ones that have sometimes flourished the best when they get their chance to put their hands on something that's meaningful. So the whole, um, working with your mind, working with your hands, a distinction uh, dissolves before your very eyes when these students who were previously alienated are now being some of the lead learners and that teachers and families and even the students themselves are saying, I never would have believed that this student, that, this, that I would be like this or this student would be like this. So this is early stages, but we think it's an explosive hypothesis that we actually could help the students that are most disconnected go the furthest. And when they go the furthest, they know a lot about life because they've, uh, they've had a, a, a lot of uh, difficulties in lives. So this is what that leads us to students as agents of change. It really is across all types of students, uh, from those that didn't do well, that, that those that are doing very well, it's everybody, it's all students have this potential. And that uh, Dewey's uh, observation 100 years ago, life and learning merge, uh, and then the surprise that we had, because we didn't build it into design, as people got into this, as students and teachers did, 
students really said, uh, helping humanity. Um, a student in, for example, a 12 year old girl in Uruguay, we have this buddy, pity was well, says, uh, I, I'm supposed to help humanity. I think I'll start with my own community. And she does, with a team of girls, uh, does amazing things about uh, saving local gardens from birds that were destroying them. So a lot of things that go like this, working with others and working on something important is an intrinsic motivator and really pulls people in for the best of. It's intrinsic, but it's not lonely. It's, connect, it's not in isolation, it's in teams. So this is fantastic leverage potentially, and we want it to spread. And then uh, when we think of the system, uh, the, the bigger system, uh, we are, just to remind you, we are working um, uh, not just in this or that school. These, two, these schools are in clusters, and these schools are often in clusters that cover the whole uh, district or whatever. So uh, we don't imagine this and we don't treat this as individual innovators or one school at a time. We, uh, we treat it, if you just take the levels here, this is mobilizing the classroom. It is developing the school as the context of integrative learning. It's placing the school in the context of the, of the district, whether it's five schools or in the case of some of our full districts, 85 schools that are moving in this. And then it then connects to the context of policy, the whole system, uh, the way in which we're, we see changes now in how uh, assessment is being organized and even on the issues about many systems now are questioning their narrow uh, testing and they're wanting to move away from this into this. So right now we're at the kind of crossroads of uh, people, uh, including a lot of politicians are saying, we know for sure now that not only did the old system not work, but the strategies and policies aren't working either. So we better change. They're not sure what the change should be. They are sure there should be change. And therefore, deep learning we see as entering this equation at exactly the right time to be able to uh, be part of the solution and to spread quickly. So it's a slow start, but the good thing about this is it motiv motivates people so well and so quickly that it accelerates after you get started. You need that start slow, go fast. It's one of our uh, observations. And this is what we uh, were able to do, I think. And the reason that this book is flying off the shelf, I think, is that uh, people see it as a real catalyst that can go somewhere and they can't wait to get involved. Where our concern is, we're all going to need a lot of support to make this work on any scale, but it ex it's a really exciting because it's happening at lightning speed. So this is just to give you a flavor of the book itself and that it really is intended as a pathway, a guided pathway with tools and resources. You can see there are six sections. It provides text, which talks about the concepts, but also protocols that are facilitated ways of helping ourselves build capacity and within our peer groups, um, and then tools that we can use in a really practical sense um, to get things going as well it includes um, a tremendous number of vignettes like the videos that you've seen um, and short stories, learning design examples that help people get started because that's what's really important. And it contains the three sets of tools that are, as Michael has said, when we look at the three levels of change within the classroom, the global competencies, the first set, and the second one is how to design deep learning. And then the third set of tools are around how do we build the kind of uh, support and conditions for deep learning at the school level, at the district level, and at the system level. So with those things in mind, we, um, if you want to know more, uh, we do have a one day session um, on November the 10th. Each year we have a global deep learning lab where practitioners from the eight countries come together to share what they've been learning. That's the knowledge building part. Um, that's happening in Toronto in November, and one of the days will be spent on a, a one-day pre-conference on the dive into deep learning and all of the, the tools and tips, and that's where you can join us in Toronto. If you want to know more about um, the whole process of deep learning, the website for the public is npdl.global, and we invite you to take a look there. So, um, Michael, is there anything else you want to add before we turn it over to Jeff? 
No, let's go for the questions. Okay. Terrific. Uh, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, there's quite a few questions. We'll get to a few and then um, I'll send you the other ones and you can answer them when you send everybody their link to the video towards the end of the week. So question number one, one of the first questions from our teachers is how do we assess the six C's? What resources can we share with our teachers as we try to build their assessment literacy? Okay, Joanne. Sure. Um, when I talked about the progressions, that's the, the method that we use to assess the six C's. On a day-to-day -day basis, you're assessing them using a whole variety of assessment strategies. You might use observation, uh, looking at student work products, processes, um, conversations, observing them, collaborating with other students, depending on what it is that you're assessing. So it's a multiple methods of looking at progress over time. But then to assess whether or not we're actually moving forward, you take a look at that and use the progression and look for those key words within each of those cells to see predominantly where do we think the students are operating and how do we move forward. And we have jurisdictions that are using them for their reporting process uh, right along with some of the traditional academics and some are actually moving towards competency-based assessment wholeheartedly. Thank you. Um, I'd like to hear your views on how to engage parents in their child's deep learning. Is there uh, some guidelines that you can provide for engaging parents? Yeah, let me start in that, and Joanne may want to add to it. In, uh, in some ways, uh, parents are uh, very traditional, as, as we know, who are concerned with how does my, how does my child get the best possible grades, uh, especially when it gets to high school, get, get into the best universities, and uh, just be successful in that, that sense. And I just take a stop critique on that. It's, all, it's becoming clear that those pathways that are the traditional pathways you can be successful at them, uh, that is, you can get the outcome and still not be good at life. In fact, the chances of not be good at life are pretty high in that. But we have that as, as one. The second is parents also want their students to learn uh, literacy and numeracy. They don't want to fool around, so to speak, with these abstract global competencies. So there's a, there's a kind of a bias against them, I guess, on day one when they first are raised. But remember, this is a participative development where we're, when we work with a school and a community and a district, it's the, uh, the, the teachers, the administrators, uh, the students and parents of the community that are co-developing the entry point to this. And uh, here's my main point. When uh, parents see their students incredibly excited about schooling in a way they've never seen that before, when the students want to go to school earlier or stay later, when they're taking stuff home and want to share with their parents, all of this stuff we've documented in schools have in their videos, the parents, the, the, the route to the parents is through the students' uh, excitement about learning. And that's what we see. And once that happens, it kind of uh, takes off. So there's a little bit of uh, skepticism or uh, reserve at the beginning, but it's quickly transformed once the students start being excited and start to share what they're learning. I concur completely with that. So that you don't spend a lot of time talking about something way off in the future that we're going to do. But as, as you start small and engage kids in this, they'll go home and they're your best ambassadors. And then what we're seeing is parents are then knocking on the school door and the classroom door saying, you know, I know somebody who could help with that. Or, you know, here I have an idea. So that it, it becomes a very rich uh, emergent design. Thank you. Um, I want to give deep learning a try for my next teaching unit. How do I get started in preparing my lessons? Do you have examples of other teachers and what they've done with their lesson plans? Is there some place where I can find some guidance that I can use to help me um, with my next teaching unit? That's a, a great question. I'll jump in with that one because uh, that's why we wrote this book, to be honest, was so that everybody could find their own starting point um, where they felt most comfortable. And what it does is guide people through, through those steps. What we normally say to people is the first thing is think about something you're already doing in the next couple of weeks. How might you use one of the competencies more intentionally? And what would you do and how would you do that? And gradually ease in that way. 
but we do also provide um, learning design examples, sort of unit examples, shorter lesson examples at different grade levels, um, written stories of what teachers have done to get started and how their children are engaging. And for our member schools, um, there are hundreds of these examples and videos on their, the member uh, website. I would say I would just also add that this is not a, um, a lone wolf proposition. Mm -hmm. uh, usually when people are starting up, they're in small groups and there's a lot of mutual excitement and support and questions uh, on, on the local scene. And then we're able to relate to that group. Yes, good point. We do um, capacity building with groups and they can either do that using the book themselves to facilitate small group learning or um, with us helping them to generate that initial capacity building and orientation. They also um, were finding they're helping each other. So for example, this morning when I was checking our Zoom, um, I could see that uh, a group from Utah was connecting with our group from Ottawa, uh, Ottawa in Canada about the learning that they're doing. So they're sharing those examples across different jurisdictions as well. Terrific, thank you. This will be the last question. And again, I'll send you all the others. Um, last question, how does the deep learning framework align with subject matter content that students learn in school? Or is it taught in isolation? For instance, how does a STEM teacher implement this framework in a grade six math or science class? A damn good question. I'm going to give it to Joanne. <laughs> Um, it's an excellent question. It's the kind we get all the time. It isn't an either or proposition. You can't do global competencies without content, without some academic learning. So it's, I describe it as putting on a pair of glasses. It's like putting on these lenses through which you are viewing the curriculum. So whatever you're planning to teach in STEM in your grade six math class, you've got some outcomes, some objectives, some standards, some learning goals, um, and you have identified what the success criteria would be if your students were successful with those. But as you are designing the learning experiences, you want to be asking yourselves, when I think about these competencies, which ones lend themselves to these big ideas or concepts that we're working on? And how do I make sure intentionally that I'm actually building these skills in? We've had children collaborating forever. I've been a teacher for a really long time and we always said, oh, our children are collaborating because we put them in groups. But I don't think we had precise ways of assessing are they getting better at being a collaborator that will help them for the future in life. So you're thinking about those competencies vis-a-vis -vis, as an overlay to the content that you were already going to teach anyway. And they're mutually supportive. Terrific. Thank you very much. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it back over to Sharon. Thank you um, all for joining our presentation today. Um, and thank you, especially Joanne and Michael. Um, as a follow-up, Corwin will be sending you a link to a recording of this pr presentation within a week. You are free to share this recording um, far and wide. If you are interested in learning more about this topic, we invite you to use the code WEBINARS in all caps on www.corwin.com for a 20% discount on any of Joanne or Michael's books published by Corwin. This concludes our presentation. Thank you and have a wonderful evening.